Hi, everyone. Welcome to the This is Kifwane session of the 2022 CAN Conference. This is Kat Ashley, president of Kifwane.org and Parker's mom. We know how important it is to gather as much clinical data and research as we can to demystify Kifwane associated neurological disorder and figure out how to treat it. The Kifwane.org community prides ourselves in supporting and accelerating that research, such as the ongoing clinical research at Chung Lab. We rely on objective, standardized measures to figure out exactly how CAN causes symptoms and how it progresses over time. But we could gather every single potential measurement in the world, in the lab, or in the hospital, and it still wouldn't give us a complete picture of CANT. CANT is more than a list of symptoms or the data you read about in the literature. It impacts virtually every aspect of a patient's life and the lives of their caregivers and family members. When you read that CAN causes spasticity, ataxia, optic nerve atrophy, seizures, intellectual disability, and so on, we want you to understand what that means in our lives. It means that kids aren't able to play on playgrounds or learn alongside their peers in the classroom. It means that someone living with CAN may not be able to communicate their basic needs or safely navigate daily life, such as getting dressed or making a meal. It means a future of uncertainty. Um, what kind of independence, if any, will my loved one be able to enjoy? What skills or abilities will they lose? Will they live? What happens when I, the caregiver, dies? Caregivers in the family community created the This is Kifwane campaign, which you can see on our social media channels every Sunday, to share the raw, hard truths of Kifwane life. We share our stories because we want other families to understand that they are not alone. And we share our stories so that everyone else in the community, the clinicians, the researchers, the supporters of our mission, can gain a small glimpse of understanding of why we need CAN treatment now. In this session, you'll hear stories from a few families in our community and help you gain a fuller picture of CAN. Hi, I am Caitlin Coughlin, and this is Nora. Um, we are from Wisconsin, and she is two and a half years old and has the I192S um, mutation of KIF1A. Um, she is enjoying her snack right now, um, but she loves to play with balls and she loves to talk and, um, she has a five month old baby sister. So she is learning all about being a big sister and what that includes. Um, she likes to be outside and walk around, um, if someone's able to help her. She likes to play with her kitchen set and um, Nora is very resilient and kind and funny and very loving. Um, but our journey to our KIF-1A diagnosis started, um, I think when she was after six months old, um, I started noticing that she was a little bit behind in um, meeting uh, milestones um, compared to other children her age, especially um, the dreaded social media comparison started for me. Um, and then it just kind of continued. And, you know, I would talk to her doctor at her meetings um, and check in some things like that. And we were both just kind of, okay, well, every child develops differently and at their own pace. Um, and so we were at that stage for a while. And then I think after a year when she still wasn't um, crawling, um, and I kind of looked on like the CDC website of like what are milestones and what age should she um, have met those and noticing that there was <laughs> quite a few that she was behind on. Um, he then referred us to the Birth to Three program, which is the early childhood program in our state. Um, and so they did an evaluation for her at 14 months. Um, and so then they connected us with um, 
speech therapy, occupational therapy, and physical therapy. Um, so we started that journey. And um, during that, her um, speech and occupational therapist noticed that her um, eye tracking was a little bit slower. Um, and so they initially referred us to um, an eye doctor. Um, and when we were there, um, we had also noticed that her, um, she sometimes faces out a little bit and her eyes would then kind of roll back into her head. So then we were worried about seizures. Um, and so then we were referred to neurology um, and they did an EEG, um, which came back negative for any of that, um, but also referred us to an MRI. Um, and so from the MRI is when we noticed that um, her cerebellum never finished forming. So then neurology um, then referred us to genetics. Um, so the first initial test that they did um, came back with nothing. And so then we were um, given the opportunity to do um, the big test. I don't even know what it's called. Um, but that took three months, three, four months um, to get results for. Um, and so during this time, it was a lot of waiting. Um, Nora still wasn't, um, she finally started crawling at 15 months. So that was really nice to see. I think the biggest thing that we noticed um, was the issue with her being able to stand on her own and pull herself up and initially walking. I think that is the biggest challenges that we have um, just as a family and for Nora, because you can tell that she has such a desire to do that. Um, it's just like her body just gives out and doesn't let her. Um, and so I think that is kind of like the biggest impact is that seeing your kid want to do something that comes so easily to other kids, um, but she struggles so much with it. Um, and also just being able to communicate her needs and her frustrations um, is another big challenge that we have. As we got the diagnosis in February, um, 2022. And so that's been kind of a shock to our system when you Google and see what this diagnosis can entail. Um, it's not great. It's a lot of grief, um, grieving the life that you had planned out for your child and kind of seeing the struggles that they're going to have or could have um, as they get older and not knowing kind of like what the best case scenario is. Um, the whole on a spectrum thing, nobody can really give you any answer as to what your future may look like or what her future may look like. It's a lot of the plans that you had for your life are different now. Um, wondering if she'll be able to ever live independently, um, I think is a big worry. Um, what is it gonna look like in the school system? Is she gonna be able to um, do things because the geneticist basically told me that she's never gonna catch up to where kids are um, at her age. So that's another big um, grief thing and also fear is just will she be accepted by you know everyday society and kids her age and adults and will they understand um I think my hopes for treatment is that families don't have to go through this you know my kid has four types of therapies and um just had to get Botox injections yesterday um to be able to um, hopefully be able to wear her AFOs a little bit better and help her walk and um, not be, have so much tightness in her legs. Um, so I just hope that we can find a cure and so that kids can live whatever kind of life they want to live and be able to do things like play on a jungle gym and not have to worry about other people judging them or, um, being able to stand and run. So yeah, that's kind of our story and where we're at. Thanks for listening. Hi, my name is Crystalyn Wortman, and I am the mom of Bryce. He has the R254W variant of the disease. And um, I guess I'll start with 
kind of how it came to be. Um, when he was first born, he was born with a normal, you know, we had a normal pregnancy. He was, uh, um, he was born at 38 weeks and he was perfectly fine and healthy. And around six to seven months is when we started to notice that he wasn't sitting up. And so then we, you know, started trying to sit him up one day, I actually tried to sit him up and he just completely fell over. He was not able to, to sit at all. And um, so then at, we decided to wait until the nine month appointment um, to, to kind of start doing anything just because he, um, we wanted to give him some time to try to catch up and see if, if we could catch him up on our own and we weren't able to. So at nine months, we went in and they gave us all kind of referrals for different specialists to, you know, do the, the genetic testing. And, um, you know, he had some odd things going on as well. And so we went, you know, had referrals for that and physical therapy and um, occupational therapy, things like that. And um, around a year and a half, I guess it was, is when he was actually officially diagnosed with KIP-1A. And so um, when he was diagnosed, the, the doctor had no idea, I mean, you know, other than what medical journals gave information on as far as the KIP-1A diagnosis. And so my husband and I went directly to Facebook and Google and things like that to try to find out more information on our own. And we, you know, found uh, the KIP-1A parent support page, which was honestly more help to us than, than the doctor itself. Um, since then, um, Bryce is now, he'll be four in September. And so at this point, Bryce still does not sit, stand, or walk on his own. At about 26 months, he was able to learn how to more or less army crawl, and he gets around that way. That's his his way of, of getting around unless one of us is up and, and actually putting him in the gate trainer or the stander and things like that. Um, the only way that he's able to, to be mobile and get around is by crawling. And uh, recently, he's learned to, to climb as well. <laughs> Uh, which is which is fun. He um, he has to wear a helmet because he obviously has balance and coordination issues, and so um, it's not really safe for him to try to climb and um, to try to climb and um, and just be you know up and and going and doing. And so we pretty much try to keep him in a helmet all the time to for his safety purposes. Um, as far as with Bryce, he's, he's very happy and, um, he's always squealing and, um, you know, loudly proclaiming what he wants, um, even though he has no verbal language either. I guess that would be our biggest challenge is the fact that he is not able to, to sit up, to stand and walk. Um, we do the best that we can to provide him with as normal of a life as possible, taking him places, doing things and all that. Um, but it is challenging. He, you know, he can't sit up at, you know, the, the table. If we take him out to eat, he has to sit in his medical stroller and, um, you know, taking him to someone's houses can be challenging because, you know, other kids don't realize what's going on and don't know to watch out for Bryce and things like that. And so, you know, we have to constantly be right there with him, even when we take him somewhere. Um, it's me, my husband, and he, Bryce has an older brother, Ryan, who is, is great. He, um, he understands what's kind of sort of what's going on. I mean, he doesn't obviously know the full extent of it, but he understands enough about it, you know, kind of a, an overall view of our journey with, with KIP-1A um, and the challenges that it presents to us. 
Hi, I'm Charisma and my son is Cameron. Um, my son has KIF1A. His mutation is N. 211H. And as far as we are aware, he is the only person um, to date with his mutation. I first, my son is 10 years old, and I first um, noticed his symptoms actually when he was an infant. I noticed that were, there were things that he couldn't do that my daughter had done when she was younger. Um, I noticed that on the developmental chart, we were not hitting milestones as early as six months. Um, what I would be told by his pediatrician was he's a boy and boys just take longer. Nine months in, we still weren't hitting those milestones. We may hit one or two and the, left, the rest were left to chance. I was told that if he did not hit these by 12 months, that they will refer him to the early intervention program. Babies can't wait. 12 months came and he still weren't, wasn't hitting them. And I had to ask for the referral. No one ever actually referred us. I initiated the referral myself. Over a course of seven years, we have done many, many MRIs, many CT scans, um, EEGs and genetic testing. Eventually his neurologist decided, let's just test for everything under the sun, do a full genetic panel. Um, I didn't expect much because up to this point, we had done genetic testing two or three times and nothing ever came up. Well, this time something did come up. I waited three months to see the geneticist to go over the results after they were received. And I was told about KIF-1A, that that was his diagnosis. Um, together, myself and the genetic counselor Googled KIF-1A and up came KIF-1A.org. And that was the beginning of our journey, um, a bond with families and individuals that we never quite signed up for. But if we had to choose one, then this is... This is the village we would choose. Um, our life is impacted day by day. We don't live a normal per se life. My son, um, he started off with um, a walker. Um, at this point, we have progressed to him using crutches and he's always used a wheelchair for longer distances. Now that he's 10, um, I raise money to get him an electric wheelchair because it's very, very difficult to push around a 10 year old. Um, we live a bit of an unorthodox life since I was told KIF-1A is progressive. Um, I decided that when my oldest graduated high school, we would leave and explore the world. So our life is very unorthodox. I homeschool him and we live in different countries. Um, we obtain physical therapy in different countries. We still do our speech therapy twice a week. We still do our occupational therapy twice a week. And we do a lot of walking and pushing along. Um, we deal with all kinds of things under the sun. Um, we have, he has neuro optic nerve atrophy. Um, he has spasticity. Um, we deal with um, dystonia. If he's sick, his body can't take the different um, effects of being sick. So we deal with dystonia, um, autism, and just a ADHD, some ADHD and more of the alphabet soup. Treatment would allow us to live maybe even a little bit of a normal life. It would be nice to be able to take him to an amusement park and he can jump onto the horse of a carousel. It would be nice for him to step onto a school bus, which he loves anything with wheels without maneuvering the crutches or you know, needing help to lift his foot up on the bus. It would be nice to take him to the monster truck rally and not have to sit in the back with the handicapped seating. Um, yeah, I'm not 
really looking for the big things for treatment, just quality of life. And that's our story. Hello, I'm Sabrina Mainini and this is Bill, Bill Mainini. Um, we are brother and sister. Um, we are originally from Framingham, Massachusetts. And um, Billy is, how old are you, Bill? 59. 59. Um, we have been on a long journey um, of diagnosis. Um, when Bill was younger, it became pretty clear um, that uh, there was uh, missing milestones, apparently, and they originally thought cerebral palsy. And then as he's gotten older, um, we noticed more atrophy and spasticity in his limbs and cognitive delays. And so they had at one point diagnosed him with Friedrich's ataxia, then spinocerebellar ataxia. And about uh, 10 years ago, I went on a journey of the genetics um, because I was having a child and I wanted to see if it was um, hereditary, uh, what Billy's uh, condition was. And that started uh, down another genetic path that um, ultimately cul culminated in um, having no diagnosis because he did not carry the genes for Friedrich's ataxia or, or spinocerebellar ataxia. So about three years ago, we went to a new neurologist um, in Boston who connected us with some of the top genetic specialists, and they did a full genetic array finally. Um, and for the first time in 59 years, or well, 56 years, we actually have a real diagnosis. Um, and Bill has the variant of R254Q. Um, and Bill has been with me for 20 years. He lives with me in my home with my daughter and my nephew and our two dogs. <laughs> and Bill, what do you like to do? What are your interests? Um, go to the casino and go to the movies. And what did you recently do for your last birthday? Uh, I want to pick... What is it called? Hand gliding. Hand gliding. And what did you did you like it? Yes, I love this. <laughs> I'm gonna go again. You want to go? No, you don't. You said you didn't want to. <laughs> <laughs> I changed my mind. I want to go again. It's fun. And Billy, what are some of the symptoms that are most challenging for you? What are some of the things that you can't do that uh, that affect you the most? I can't walk. I know. When you'd like to, right? I would, uh, that's my dream in life, to be able to walk. Like you used to. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, Bill used to be able to walk until he was in about his early 20s. And he still can walk, but the spasticity and the stiffness, unfortunately, um, and the balance issues, um, he was required to go into a wheelchair for his own safety. Um, you know, we still, we find that, if Bill stops using a skill, he loses the skill. So we try to keep Bill as independent as possible so um, that he's doing all the things that he can do and even pushing himself to keep doing them. Um, the more that he does, the more he regain, you know, keeps the, the skill and doesn't lose those skills. Mm, one more thing I'm do, doing exercising the program. He goes to a day program where he exercises and tries to keep up the strength in his legs and his arms so that he has more functionality with those. What do we worry about? You know, we worry about the longevity of Bill's life. You know, they told us at 19, you know, well, they told us when he was a kid, he wouldn't live past 19. When he was 19, they said he wouldn't live past 30. And then they stop telling us anything at all because we don't know what's coming. Um, you know, we go through a series of plateaus where, you know, everything's kind of status quo for many years. And then we usually experience kind of a, a deep decline in skills and issues. Um, and right now we're kind of in a plateau again, thank goodness. Um, so we don't know what's coming, but, you know, I Bill's healthy otherwise. I mean, he does have other 
uh, comorbidities in addition to KIF-1A. Uh, he's diabetic. He has uh, rapid cycle bipolar, high blood pressure. Uh, basically, he's just a hot mess, but he's still pretty, pretty healthy. Um, and he lives a very full life. You know, he goes out for dinner. He goes out with friends. He goes out with his family. We travel went to Disney. You know, we're planning hopefully on a cruise, maybe to Portugal next year. Um, you know, we try to, like I said, keep him active, keep him engaged. And, uh, you know, my biggest worry as a family member is if I die before him, who's going to take care of him. That's really, you know, my biggest concern. And also, you know, after 20 years, you know, when am I going to get a break, <laughs> which would be nice. Um, but I'm looking into alternatives to uh, nursing homes and assisted livings. I'm uh, working with my local um, DDS office to see if I can't at some point turn my home into a group home so that Bill could stay here and I can get um, a house manager in so that I could kind of live a, a more carefree life for myself. And as I'm getting older, because I'm 51, um, I'm hoping by 60, I'll be able to semi-retire and uh, do a little travel. So, well, I hope that uh, meeting Bill and I have been fun and that we've answered your questions, but feel free uh, to reach out to us. Thank you.